Hi everyone, today we're going over chapter 6 of physics for the MCAT, which covers circuits. Chapter 6.1 is about current, which is defined as the movement of positive charges. However, we know now that um, current is actually caused by the movement of electrons, which are negative charges. So if you see current going in a specific direction, just know that the electrons are actually moving in the opposite direction. A useful concept is that of conductivity, which is just how much current can this material conduct, and this is in units of Siemens, also known as S, or 1 over ohms. The reason why this is important is because um, ohms is the unit for resistance, which is just the opposite of conductivity. It's the ability to resist a current from flowing, and so it's pretty intuitive that conductivity would be the reciprocal of um, resistance. There are two main types of conductivity. There's metallic conductivity, which is just the conductivity of a metal. Um, metals are usually described as a sea of electrons because all of the atoms in the metal are effectively sharing all of the electrons and the electrons are fairly free flowing, which is why metals are so conductive because um, the electrons can flow from one side to the other really easily. The other type of conductivity is known as electrolytic conductivity. Um, electrolytic conductivity is when ions are dissolved in a certain um, solution and the ions themselves have charges and so they're the ones that will be moving around to create a current or a movement of charge. And this type of conductivity is concentration based. So for example, if you dissolved NaCl, which is table salt, into a cup of water, the more salt that you dissolve, the more conductive the solution will be, which makes sense because the more um, NaCl you dissolve, the more positive and negative charges you have that are able to move around and create a current. So current is um, denoted with the letter capital I, and it is defined as Q over delta T, where Q is the amount of charge and delta T is time. So current is defined as how many charges are moving past a certain point um, over a certain amount of time. And this is in units of amps. So there are two types of currents. One is called direct current, which is just current moving in one direction, and the other is called alternating current. So alternating current is actually what most of our um, appliances use now. However, the MCAT will not focus on alternating current. We'll only be talking about direct current to make things easier. Um, so another concept that's useful is the idea of potential difference. So we discussed in the last chapter um, what a volt is. And this is a really, really important concept in this chapter. Um, so a potential difference is also known as the electron motive force, denoted by these things, um, but it is also what's known as voltage. So voltage is the same thing as potential difference, which means that if you have two points in space and one has a higher potential and the other has a lower potential, then your charged particle is going to want to move from the higher potential to the lower potential. And so I like to think of voltage as a kind of potential energy, um, kind of like if you raise an object off the ground and now it has more potential energy and wants to fall toward Earth. Um, this is how I think about voltage as well. And so volt, although it's called electron motive force, voltage is not a real type of um, force. It's actually a measure of kind of potential energy. So now that we know these things, we can talk about some of the rules that govern circuits. So our first rule is going to be Kirchhoff's junction rule. So all this rule means is that the amount of current that goes into a junction is the same as the amount of current going outside, going out of the junction. So if you look at this junction that I drew here, um, there, there's more to the circuit. I just didn't draw all of it. So if we have this one path going in, let's say that this one path is maybe five amps, um, then we know that the amount going in is the same as the amount going out, so the other two branches, if this one was three amps, then this one must be two amps. And um, that's all there is to the junction rule, and it makes intuitive sense. If you have five charges going in, you have to have five charges going back out. The next rule is the loop rule. 
So all circuits are going to be loops. And so if you look at the circuit that I drew here, first of all, this, um, the symbol over here is how you denote a battery. Typically the long side will be the positive side and the short side will be the negative side. Um, but a battery has to have a positive and a negative side. And what a battery does is that it drives all of the charges in a circuit from one side to the other side. So in this case, this is the positive side. And so there are no charges on, there are no electrons on that side. And the side is the negative side, which means that all of the electrons are built up on the side. And so this gives the positive side of the battery a um, very high uh, voltage and the negative side of the battery a much lower voltage. And so all that the loop rule means is that when we go around this loop, um, all of these 10 volts have to be accounted for somewhere because you, you don't just change voltage for no reason. So when we go around the circuit, we can see that we have two of these squiggly line things. These squiggly line things are what are known as resistors, and resistors cause um, voltage to be dissipated. So when we go around this loop, we can say that at the first resistor, maybe we lose 5 volts, or we have a voltage drop of 5 volts, and at the second resistor, we also drop 5 volts. And so the loop rule just says that everything has to be accounted for. So if we start here at 10 volts, then we lose 5 volts, and then we lose another 5 volts, then that makes sense. So when we get back here, we have zero volts. Chapter 6.2 is about resistance. And you can calculate resistance with this equation. It's going to be in units of ohms. And so resistance is defined by rho. This rho is going to be a constant. It's called the resistivity. And this is going to be a different constant for every kind of material. L is the length of your resistor. So if you think of a resistor as kind of like a filter, then the longer this filter is, the more distance it has to filter stuff out. And so the longer it is, the um, more resistant it will be. Um, and this is divided by area. So if you think about it once again as a filter, then the wider this filter is, the more charge is going to be able to go through it at any given time. And so the bigger the area, then the less resistance something has. And the most important equation in this entire chapter, I think, is Ohm's law. And Ohm's law is equal to V equal to IR, where V is voltage, I is current, and R is resistance. And this um, equation governs basically all of circuits, and you need to know this equation. It might be more intuitive to think about it as... I, which is current, equals voltage over resistance. Um, it might be more helpful to think about it this way because current will be bigger if the voltage is bigger and current will be smaller if the resistance is bigger. Um, but v, v equals IR, very, very important. And another equation that's kind of helpful is power. So in circuits, we think about power not as... Um, doing something but we think of it more in the context of power that is dissipated and power that is dissipated specifically by a resistor so we talked about in this picture up here that um this resistor is basically causing a voltage drop of five volts and so it, it if it's taking away voltage then it has to dissipate power and so in circuits power is defined as p equals iv um, there are some obscene mnemonics to remember this, and this is all also equal to I squared equals R, which we can find simply by plugging in V equals IR to P equals IV. Um, a mnemonic for this is twinkle twinkle little star, P equals I squared R, and this is also equal to V squared over R. Um, but you can find both of these other forms just by plugging in V equals IR to P equals IV. And this is how you find how much power is dissipated by each resistor. So if we're looking at our circuit above, we can plug in the current, which I didn't give you for the circuit, um, and then the voltage. Here we're going to look at what's going to happen if you have multiple resistors in the same circuit. And the difference between resistors in series and resistors in parallel is another very important distinction in this chapter. 
So first off, a resistance in series is when you have the uh, multiple resistors just lined up in a row such that if you had a charge, then this charge must go through all of the resistors in order to get to the other side. Resistance in parallel means that if you have a charge um, over here wanting to get to the other side, you can choose any path. So you can choose to go through R1, R2, or R3. Um, it's not important here that I drew resistor 1 closest to the um, entrance and the exit of this circuit part. You can draw these anywhere. Um, the only important part is that your charges can choose to go through um, R1, R2, or R3. And so if you have a resistor, if you have resistors in series, um, we can think about the equation V equals IR. And we know that um, current, we know that current is going to be constant throughout this entire circuit. Because if you have a charge, or if you have three charges over here, on the other side, you're always going to end up with three charges. Um, so we can just ignore this I term for now. And if we think about the voltage drops, so the total voltage drop for resistors in series is going to be that the total voltage drop is equal to all of the voltage drops added together. And this is because if you have a voltage drop of let's say two volts here, one volt here, and two volts here, then the total then the total voltage drop will um, be the sum of all of these because your charge is going to have to go through each and every one of these to get to the other side. Um, and so it follows that the total resistance is going to be also all of the resistances added together following the equation V equals IR. And so um, this is really important if, let's say you had a question that said um, the resistance of R1 is going to be 3 ohms and of R2 it's going to be 2 ohms and of R3 it's going to be 1 ohm then it wants to know the total resistance of the circuit. Then you would just add them all up and you would say that the total resistance is going to be equal to 6 ohms. You can also do this if um, it tells you the voltage drop of each resistor or if it tells you the total voltage drop and asks you to go back and find the voltage drops of each individual resistor. So it gets a little bit more complicated with, when we think about resistors in parallel. Um, so first off, if we want to think about the voltage drops of resistors in parallel, we can think that the voltage drop of V1, um, which is the drop of R1, is the same as for um, R2, and it's the same as for R3. So we're not going to be adding them together. We're going to say that they're equal to each other. And this is because, let's say that the voltage up here is 8 volts, and the voltage down here is 4 volts, then that means no matter which path the charge took, it had a voltage drop of um, 4 volts. So R3 is going to have a voltage drop of 4 volts, so is R2, and so is R1, um, because the charge only takes one of the paths to get from one side to another. And then um, the second equation, which is that the total resistance, or rather the reciprocal of the total resistance, is equal to the reciprocal of um, each individual resistor. And if you think about this a little, what this means is that the more resistors you add, um, the less resistance you actually have, which makes a lot of sense actually, because if you think about resistors as um, like blocking the current, then if you add more paths, so if you only had R1, here, then all of your charges can only go through R1, which will slow them down significantly. But then if you add two more resistors, that's two more paths your charge can go down, which means that there's actually less resistance, even though there are more resistors. And so um, these equations are also similarly useful. So like if you were given the resistances of each individual resistor and asked to add them all up together into a total. Um, another way these equations can be used is, let's say I'm drawing a hypothetical circuit where here we have one resistor, R1, and here we have R2, and here we have R3, 
and we have current going kind of this way. This is not how you draw circuit notation. You wouldn't put an arrow here. Um, I'm just adding it for clarity. And so if we wanted to know um, the total resistance of this entire circuit element, then we would first want to add up R2 and R3 in parallel. And we know they're in parallel because when once you get here, you can either choose to go this way or that way. Um, and so we would add them up using that the total resistance, I'm going to call this R4, is equal to 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3, or this is 1 over R4, sorry. Um, and then we can go and redraw the circuit because we've now added R2 and R3 together. So now we have R1 and R4, and R1 and R4 are now in series with each other. And so then we can add up the total resistance of this entire circuit element is equal to R1 plus R4. And that's one of the ways that you would use all of these equations. Chapter 6.3 is about capacitance and capacitors. So capacitance is just the ability for anything to hold a charge. Um, capacitance is calculated with this equation, um, where C is the capacitance of a particular capacitor, and it's equal to Q, which is charge, over V, which is voltage. So what this means is that if you have something with a capacitance of, say, one farad, a farad is the unit of a capacitor, and your entire circuit has a voltage of, let's say, five, then you're going to be able to um, hold five charges in your capacitor. But let's say your voltage is now 15, um, because the voltage of a circuit can change based on the battery. So if you now add a stronger battery, this capacitor is now going to be able to hold more charge. Um, so capacitance is the measure of how many charges it can hold per voltage of the circuit and not a direct measure of how many charges it can hold. And a farad is in units of C, which is coulombs. This is not capacitance, this is coulombs over volts because coulombs is the unit for charge. So capacitors are drawn um, this way with two parallel lines. This looks kind of like a battery, but don't get this confused with a battery. A battery will always have one short line and one long line. Another difference between um, a capacitor and a battery is that a capacitor has to be charged by a battery, um, and a capacitor can only hold charge for a very limited amount of time. A capacitor doesn't have energy on its own. The um, only ability of a capacitor is to hold charges away from each other. And also, always in a capacitor, the um, charge of the negative side has to be equal to the positive side. So if the side is, let's say, five, if you have five charges here, then you have to have negative five here. And this is because in order for this to happen, um, all of the charges must be driven from the negative side to the positive side. And then, so therefore the negative side will have the same amount of deficiency of charge that the positive side has charge. If that didn't make sense, don't worry, this is not very important. Um, what's important is this equation here. So capacitance can also be calculated as E0, which is this constant here. Um, you'll be given this constant, don't worry about remembering it, and multiplied by the area of the capacitor. So this is multiplied by area because the larger the area of your capacitor plate, um, the more charge it can hold, and this is divided by the distance between the plates. Um, so the closer together your plates are, the higher the capacitance, and this is because each plate has its own electric field, and so the closer um, the plates are, the, more the, f the stronger the fields will be. Um, yeah, so these are the two equations you would use to calculate capacitance. Um, another concept is that of a dielectric material, um, which is also known as an insulator. So this equation here, um, C prime, which is your new altered capacitance as a result of the dielectric. Oh, so dielectric material is one you can place in the middle of your capacitor. And this alters the um, capacitance of your capacitor because 
essentially the dielectric takes up a bunch of the free space here and so it effectively brings the capacitors closer together um, because there's less space between and so the new altered capacitance is going to be equal to k which is a constant multiplied by the original capacitance um, and so this k will always be greater than one which means your new altered capacitance will always be greater than the old one um, if it was less than one then it wouldn't be a dielectric material anymore i forgot to mention this so the potential energy that's stored in a capacitor is equal to u equals one half c v squared where c is the capacitance and v squared is the voltage so I think of this kind of like the equation 1 equals mv squared. That's just how I remember it, um, where mass is kind of like capacitance and velocity is kind of like voltage. Um, this always made sense to me. Similar to for resistors, we can also have capacitors in series and in parallel, but these equations are going to be the opposite of those seen for resistors. And so to understand why this makes sense, we can look at the equation that we wrote for capacitance, which is E0, which is a constant, multiplied by area over distance. And so when we look at um, capacitors in series, which means that if you had a charge, it would go through all three of these capacitors. Um, effectively, what is going to happen is that this charge is going to have to go through three separate distances. Um, there's going to be D1, D2, and D3. So we have to add up all of these distances. And as we can see in this equation, the greater the total distance, the less the total capacitance, which is why we use this equation, which means that the more capacitors you add in series, the less, capa the less total capacitance there is going to be. Um, and if we think about the situation in parallel, which in resistors we used the um, this equation of reciprocals, when we look at capacitors, we're going to just add them all up. And this is because if you had a charge and it can choose to go through each of the paths, then it's only going to go through one distance, so this distance term is unchanged. However, you have a situation where charge can build up on each of these plates, which means actually if you have three capacitors, then three times the charge can be built up. Um, and therefore, we have a case where the capacitance equals all of the individual capacitances added together. If you're wondering why we can't also add up the areas in um, the case of capacitors in series, we can think back to our equation C equals Q over V, um, where V is voltage and Q is the amount of charge. And so if we think that for both of these series, um, if for both of these systems of capacitors, we have a voltage drop of three, which means that up here we have three volts and down here we have zero volts. This means that in the case in parallel, each of these capacitors is going to have a voltage drop of three. So if our capacitance is one, then we can have three Q, or Q is in units of coulombs, over three volts, um, which gives us more charge. But on the other hand, in series, we're going to have three separate voltage drops. So each voltage drop, if we have a capacitance of one, is going to be one coulomb over one volt. And so that's why, um, even though they're in series, it doesn't mean they're going to be able to hold more charge. Chapter 6.4 is about meters, which are all the different devices that you can use to measure your components of a circuit. This is pretty straightforward. An ammeter measures current in amps. A voltmeter measures voltage drops in volts. And for both an ammeter and a voltmeter, you're gonna to wanna to turn your circuit on because you can't measure current unless the circuit is running. And you also can't measure a voltage drop unless your circuit is running because if your circuit isn't running, then there is going to be no voltage drop. Um, for an ohmmeter, it measures resistance in ohms. And for an ohmmeter, your circuit should be off because for an ohmmeter, um, your ohmmeter is going to run its own current through the resistor to find out how much resistivity there is. 
Um, and so thank you so much for watching. I hope that this video helped you out. And yeah, see you in the next chapter.